Uh, today's a day I've been looking forward to a couple of months ago uh, with a recommendation from a good friend, Jim Jones. I joined an organization called uh, Veterans for Idaho. Uh, that's the current name now. And uh, for the last couple of months, uh, every other Wednesday we have a Zoom meeting that Todd Achilles hosts from Boise, and it's a bipartisan group, uh, group I'm involved. Kevin Trainer just joined recently. We have Jim Jones, who's the one that convinced me to jo join, and also Larry LaRocco. So there's a broad, wide spectrum of people from a bipartisan standpoint that are involved with this organization. But enough of that. Today, we have Todd Achilles, who's going to speak to us, and also uh, Rebecca Rotsman. Uh, Rebecca is involved with uh, the Open Primary Initiative and the organization that she's involved with, which uh, is maybe just a little bit surprising. It's the Mormon Women for Ethical Government. Uh, Todd Achilles uh, is a co-founder of Veterans for Idaho. He was formerly in a previous life a tank commander and platoon leader in the Army. Uh, he's a board member of the Frank Church Institute and the Idaho Center for Fiscal Policy. I'm not going to take any more time introducing our presenters today, but Todd and Rebecca, thanks for coming. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, what's the best way to do this? I'll, I'll, I'll just shove you up because I'm ready. <laughs> okay. All right, well, I appreciate everybody's time today. Rich, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so the organization is Veterans for Idaho Voters. We, we set this up as, as uh, Rich said, Jim Jones was really the catalyst behind this. Um, we've got a nice uh, mix of uh, vets from all across the state, uh, which you, you missed Rich is our chairman is Governor Otter and Democratic Congressman LaRocco and, and, and folks from all over, from all different political views. But you know, our mission is really about about fair elections, citizen initiatives, civil politics, and sensible policies. Uh, and we're, we're really focused on the open primaries initiative. The, um, oh, we got it? Okay, so quick agenda here. So we're gonna talk about the open primaries initiative um, and just explain what it does, what it doesn't do. A lot of things that people have, have heard about it um, one, I just want to dispel right now, everybody does not get a pony if this passes. Uh, so, but let's, let's talk through what it means for our elections. And then we've got a mock vote that we'll be able to do on this and then we'll wrap up with questions. And then just a quick introduction here. Rebecca, oh. you wanna? Yeah, sorry, um, I'm Rebecca Bratzman. I live in, I live in Boise. Um, I am the chapter coordinator for Mormon Women for Ethical, Ethical Government. I know it's, we just call ourselves MWAG. It's a little easier. Um, we are a nonpartisan organization. We focus on policies, um, peacemaking, um, a lot of um, work, also uh, bipartisan work, um, because we are interested in creating effective government that serves the people. Um, and I often focus, or I often teach media literacy as well. And the Rich gave a little bit of my background, but one of the co-founders of this, I, I actually came out of the high-tech industry, so a long time at Hewlett Packard and T-Mobile. Uh, Eric and I are talking all things wireless. Um, I teach public policy now, and as Rich said, uh, I was a tank commander, which is when you're going on active duty in the Army and you're 5'9", that's the perfect job for you. Um, this is my uh, platoon in Kuwait in the early 90s, and I can confidently say I'm one of the few people who has more hair now than I did back then. Um, are there any other uh, vets in the room here? Was it Danny, Kevin? Great. Well, we're looking for new members. I know Ron in the back, uh, who uh, has been supporting us here. He spent 13 years in the Marine Corps. So thank you. Okay, so today's talk, you wanna go through this? Sure, I'll, uh, you can just, um, so, one of the reasons that MWEG joined up together with um, Veterans for Idaho Voters, sorry, yeah, for Veterans for Idaho Voters and to support the open primary initiatives is because this issue to us is a civics issue. 
Um, it is uh, one that um, aligns both with a lot of the religious um, reasons that we engage in the political process. Um, for us, if we are going to love our neighbor as ourselves, then we have to allow our neighbors to engage in the democratic process. Um, and right now, that, that is not happening um, in Idaho. And um, so for us, as an organization that only focuses on policies, um, this is a perfect issue because it's a civic issue and it's about good government and it's not about a political party. Great. So for the, for the talk today, we're going to really focus on kind of the mechanics of how elections are run. Um, we're not going to talk about the politics or, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some candidates that have been on a ballot, but this isn't about political parties. This is about just running elections. So let's talk about the problem here. At the national level, you know, obviously we've got an increasing uh, partisanship and, um, and non-cooperation. You don't have to look much further than the uh, House of Representatives right now to see that there's still a lot of this going on, too much of it. Uh, what's interesting is when you look at the last uh, election cycle, 83% uh, of U.S. House members were selected by just 8% of registered voters, which means that they got elected in a low turnout primary um, and basically had little or no competition in their general election. So a very small chunk of the of, of registered voters is deciding um, who represents these districts. Uh, the Economist magazine, every year they do this democracy index. Uh, last year we were 30th. We were ranked in with the flawed democracies. We were down five points from the year before. And what the, what the Economist said is, you know, our score is weighed down by the country's intense levels of political and cultural polarization that's hardened into political sectarianism and institutional gridlock. Which unfortunately kind of sounds like where we are now. And most importantly, President Washington, General Washington, our only independent president, uh, warned about this when he left office. He, in his farewell address, he was concerned about this rising role of parties and partisanship and the threat that that posed uh, to the new nation. So that's at the national level. At the local level, you know, we've, we had 80 years of open primaries in Idaho. And that, that stopped in 2011 um, when uh, a group sued the Secretary of State to close our primaries. Um, and what that did is that excludes independents from being able to vote. About a quarter of registered voters in Idaho are independent. This, this group is twice as big as the Democratic Party, about half the size of the Republican Party. Those folks can't participate in our primaries. And when you look at the impact of closed primaries, the lowest turnout in primaries since 1980 happened in the three years after we closed it. Basically, what you're seeing is uh, uh, we're, we're seeing primary turnout now about half of where it was in 1980, 15%, 16% versus 30, 31. Um, and so the combination here of low turnout in the primaries um, and our system of just having the most votes to win means that we've got a lot of candidates winning with very few votes. It's kind of like a, a fraction. Not a lot of people are turning out, so you don't need a lot of votes on the top to win. Some candidates are winning with 9 8% of registered voters in their district. Said another way, 92% of registered voters in a district didn't have a say on who that candidate was. Uh, and so when you look at, the, again, this last cycle in 2022, on average, it took 16% of registered voters to win in the, uh, in the primary and 42% to win in the general election. So you see this big difference on the primaries. Um, and overall, we've got a big problem of just not having very competitive elections. So in the primary, 32 elections uh, had no competition, but in the general, 50 of the state state legislature, so that's 50 out of 105, had no competition. And in fact, there were nine legislative districts in Idaho in which there was no competition in the Senate, the Rep A, and the Rep B position. And honestly, I think the ballot in North Korea has more competition than what we're seeing in some parts of Idaho. Um, and I think the really important one, getting back to the point of independence, 96% of the 22 primary races could have been different if independents had been allowed to vote. Typically what you're finding is somebody may win an election with three or 400 votes, while 6,000, 7,000 independents are sitting on the sidelines. So those voices don't have a say in our primaries. 
And again, I think everybody in Idaho sees this. The Boise State University's uh, statewide survey, the last cycle was the highest ever of people feeling that our state is not on the right track. So people are seeing it. So that's the situation. Um, and when you put all of these things together, which, which you see happening in our politics is that we've got weak competition and then this low turnout to get elected. And what that results in are leaders who are beholden only to that small group that elected them. And then when they get into the state house, they're making policies that are targeted to who, who got them in there rather than their whole district. And so we have this kind of representation problem, which is fundamental to, to self-government. So how do we fix this? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's really cynical, but it's, it feels true, but at the same time, it's also not, it's not a healthy, um, the candidates are not competitive within their own party, and so it, yeah. whether it was their intention or not, it doesn't yield healthy um, candidates who have, um, who have to answer to the people in the end. So, so I think the, the, the Open Primaries Initiative really has two parts to it. This is about reforming our elections and making, making our system more representative. So the two parts, one is we're going to open the primaries back up again, and then we're going to do a, a final four uh, in, the, in the general election. And we'll, I'll explain what that means, and you'll get a chance to demo. So, so what the open primary means is we're going to have one ballot with all the candidates on it. You'll see candidates from all the parties. You'll start to see independent candidates on the primary, which hasn't happened before. Um, all voters participate, so there's no limitation by parties anymore. This is going back to what we used to be. We're only using this for congressional, statewide, uh, legislative, and county elections. So judicial election, special district, the presidential primary, that stays with the current system that it is now. Um, and basically, from this, from this primary ballot, you just pick one. That's it. And then the top four vote getters in the primary advance to the general election. So this final four format, what we're, what we're doing with the Open Primaries Initiative is getting from four to one candidate that's got over 50%. And the best, fastest, most efficient way to do that is with a system called instant runoff, or also called ranked choice voting. And what you do in this is you rank the four candidates. Who's your first priority or first preference, second, third, and fourth? And the first candidate to 50% of the votes plus one wins. Now, in, in a lot of areas, there's going to be one person that's going to get that 50% right off of the bat. There's no reason for a runoff. You don't have to do any of that other stuff. But, and this is a really important part, is if your first choice is eliminated, then you're, you move to your second choice candidate, which is another way of saying you still have a voice in who gets elected. Mm -hmm. So in today's system, if you were to pick, say, a constitutional party candidate, odds are they're not going to win the general election. So a lot of people would call that a throwaway vote. But here you could put your first choice might be a constitutional candidate. Your second choice could be a Republican candidate. And maybe that Republican candidate goes through. So people still, their, their choices, their preferences still have a place. It's still one vote, but you get to rank that vote. And at the end of this thing, what we're trying to do is make sure each of the candidates has over 50%. So they really represent their district, rather than just winning with a slice in the primary and then coasting through in the, in the general. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples here so you guys can see it. Now, everybody, everybody's probably heard Alaska is a state that adopted the same sort of format, open primaries with a final four. Uh, this is what the ballot looked like in Alaska in November 20. 22 for the for the US Senate race and the US congressional seat and I'm just going to focus on the one down on the bottom here so for the US representative you had two Republican candidates one libertarian candidate and then one Democrat um, it's just generally on ranked choice voting there are four states that have approved it 
uh, Maine and Alaska, Nevada is going through the second part of approving it, and then Hawaii is also approved ranked choice voting. Twelve cities in Utah use ranked choice voting for municipal elections. And ten states hold instant runoff. So ten states have a requirement that the candidate breaks 50%. Uh, and in those 10 states, for military ballots, they use the same system, ranked choice voting. So um, there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of use of ranked choice voting out there, even if folks haven't heard of it before. So let's talk about this congressional race. So four candidates, you had in the first round, Mary Patola, then Sarah Palin, Nick Begich, and then Chris Bayh, Democrat, Republican, Republican, Libertarian. And you see in the first round, Mary Patola, she's like, you know, 1.3% from hitting that 50% line. Just about, just about breaks the line, but not quite. So what happens is the fourth place candidate is eliminated. So the libertarian Chris Bayh, he gets eliminated and, his, and the people that voted for Chris first, their second choice gets allocated to the others. And what you see is about half of Bayh's voters went to the Republican baggage and a quarter went to Potola and went to Palin. So now Potola is at 49.2, almost across in the line, but, but not quite. So now you eliminate the, the third place candidate in this, which is Begich, and those votes get allocated. Basically, three quarters go to Palin, one quarter go to, go to Potola. And this is how the, the ranked choice voting, the insert runoff, worked in Alaska. And so with this, Potola breaks 55%. And I think the, the interesting thing here is that, um, and you, you hear a lot of, of misinformation that this you know, changed the elections or you know, this, this result was inaccurate. But the reality is, is that there were a lot of people that were very positive on Sarah Palin. There were also a lot of people in Alaska that didn't like Sarah Palin. And that kind of negative side got, got weaved into the feedback here in terms of how other Republicans viewed her as a candidate. So 85% of Alaskans said it was easy, 72% they had equal or more choice compared to previous elections, 80%, and I think this is super important, felt like their, voice, their vote mattered more in this system. So let's talk through a couple of Idaho races. And this is just a hypothetical, but just for us to sort of think how things um, would, would be under the system. So if you go back to the 2018 governor's race, um, you had five candidates Two on, the, two on the Democrat side, three Republicans. Uh, so the, the candidate, the top four, would be three, Brad Little, Raul Labrador, Tommy Alquist, and Paulette Jordan, right? Uh, A.J. Balikoff, the, the second Democrat, wouldn't make the cut for the top four. And so the question is, in this, the, the Democrat Jordan, she had the least vote, so she would be eliminated first. So where do you think the people that voted for Paulette first, what would be their second choice? Would it be Governor Little, Labrador, Alquist? I mean, we, we don't know, and it's, there's no way to estimate this, but this is just sort of thinking about how these elections would, would change. So another race to look at is the 2018 lieutenant governor's race. And this one's a little bit different still. One Democrat, three Republicans, same as the previous one. But in this one, the Democrat actually got the most votes coming out of the primary. Kristen Cullum, also an Army veteran, whoa. Um, so if you look at this, now Marv Hagedorn, who's a member of our organization, Navy vet, we still let him in. Uh, but Marv, you know, Marv got fourth place. So Marv would have been eliminated. And where do you think Marv's voters would have, who would they have selected as their second choice? Probably not Kristen. Between uh, uh, McGeehan or Yates would, would probably be the, the guess. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of you know, what the distrib distribution of voters would have been, who would have been third place after that, and, and what the final round would have looked like? Again, we can't predict it, but this is just sort of how the system um, ensures that the winning candidate has that 50% plus one, right? has that broad support. And the last one I'll do here is just the Secretary of State's race from, from last cycle. So again, three, three Republicans, one Democrat. I think we're going to see a trend going forward in Idaho related to this in future elections when, when this passes. Um, but the last place, again, is the Democrat, uh, Sean Keenan. 
And same question, where, where do you think the second place votes would have gone? Right, and would that have pr pushed that candidate over the 50%? So I think this is, again, just looking at the mechanics of how these elections get run and how the, how the votes get distributed in this, it, it, it sets us up for a system where the candidate's got to break 50%. So let's do this. Let's do a really simple mock ballot. If you take out your smartphone and scan the QR code, and I put some uh, sheets on the table there, but grab your phone, turn the camera on, scan that code. It'll take you to, uh, it'll take you to a website. And then what you do is, where's the pointer on this? Here's the pointer. So we've got four desserts, first through fourth place. So pick which dessert is first, second, third, and fourth. And then hit submit. And oh, by the way, uh, as opposed to a real election, you could vote multiple times, but please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I should have changed the ballot to put Kevin Bradshaw's birthday cake on there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, when, when you're done, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, and we'll get a feel for how many folks have, have gone through this. Great. I see a few more. We'll give it another minute or two here. And if you, if you fat finger it or, or hit one by accident when you're going through, just start, go back to who your, which dessert is your first choice and, and just go through the list. Oh, wow, we got a lot. We good? All right, Kevin, do you want to you want to pull up the results page? And you can see the results on your on your phone too. But we'll just we'll pull it up right here. So here's the. Uh, <laughs> so if we if we go back to the beginning of this, so birthday cake got the fewest first place votes, three. So birthday cake's eliminated. Two of the three went to Barry Cobbler, one went to apple pie, it's now a tie. Ice cream's the next one to get eliminated. Three out of the four on ice cream prefer Barry Cobbler. So Barry Cobbler breaks that 50% plus one, Barry Cobbler wins. Does that make sense? It's Barry Cobbler. <laughs> any, any, uh, any questions on that? Does that make sense in terms of the, the process? Kevin, would you mind going back to the? Great. So I think just to just to wrap up here, what the open primaries initiative is about is, is really it boils down to more choices for more voters, giving more people the opportunity to vote and giving them more choices, more competition on the ballot. Um, as we've seen in a lot of other places around the country, even in Alaska, it, it really, it restores not only competition, but also civility among the candidates. We end this closed party primary system where a quarter of Idahoans can't vote. By the way, one of the largest blocks of independent voters in Idaho are military veterans. And I'm gonna do one more quick example here about why this promotes more civility. So let's just say you've got two candidates. I'll call them narrow candidate A. 35% of the voters absolutely love that candidate, first choice, but and just using a hypothetical here, 65% can't stand that candidate, put that candidate in fourth place. And you got this mainstream candidate, an Army veteran, clearly. 30% of the voters rank them first, but every, it's everyone else's second choice goes to that candidate. So as you go through the rounds, the people that voted for candidate D, their second choice is going to be that mainstream candidate. The people that voted for candidate C, their second choice is going to be that mainstream candidate. 
So you get a system here where you've got to make sure you've got a candidate that appeals to a broad swath of folks in that district. It's about representation. So finally, you know, like Rich and Kevin and everybody else in the room here as veterans, you know, we took an oath to defend the Constitution. We honestly believe that fair elections and giving people the, the right to vote the way they want is part of our oath to the Constitution. We restore fair elections and we protect self-government in Idaho. So we, we asked folks to sign the petition. Let's get it on the ballot in November of 2024 uh, and give people more freedom to choose who they want. And with that, we'll come better leadership in the State House. And finally, just ask that you support the coalition members in this. This is, uh, this is a long uh, battle we've got to not only get the signatures, but also win the yes vote in, um, in November of 24. There's a lot of groups here, including uh, Rebecca Zemweg. Um, and if you're, if you're interested in this, and certainly if you're a veteran, we'd love to have you come join the team. Rebecca, any closing thoughts? Uh, sure. So um, we believe that the viability of democracy depends on fair and um, representative um, elections. And that's why we love the opportunity of um, open primaries. I have older children who are um, just going into, my oldest can vote, my second son will vote in November, um, opening their ballots and seeing no competition in their um, choices is discouraging. And it's discouraging for the next generation. So I want to open up that competition so that my kids can see democracy at work in Idaho. Great. All right, any, uh, any questions on this? Yes, sir. So before they change, uh, change the close primaries, what did they do? You said they closed, what year was it? In, in, in 2011. In 2011, yeah. So before that, what did they do? Before that, there, there was no requirement to say which party was. And so when you, when you walked into the booth, you could just pick whatever ballot you wanted. So everybody was on it? Uh, no, you could pick a Republican ballot, or you could pick a constitutional ballot, or a Democratic ballot. But you didn't have to declare your party affiliation as a voter to pick one of those ballots. So is that a more fair system than this? It's, uh, the, 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 problem, the, the problem with the, the original system, it, it gave the voter more options than it does now, but you were still locked into one of those ballots. So if there was a you know Republican candidate, a couple of Republican candidates you want to support, maybe there's a Democrat candidate you want to support, you couldn't do that in the primary. With this system, you can't. You could do it in the general. You could do it in the general. Yeah. 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 Sorry. If we join up to support your campaign, do we get a hat? <laughs> so, coach, if you're a veteran and you sign up uh, to join, you do get a hat. I got a couple with me right here. So, this is. This is <laughs> Thank you. So, I have a question too. So, what happens if this passes? What's to prevent the legislators from just changing the law the next year? Um, well, it's it's us. Yeah. So, if if this passes, the first open primary will be uh, May 26. And then the first instant runoff general will be November of 26. So I think like we've done on, on other citizens initiative, it's about having a conversation with your legislator and expressing why you want them to support it. You back to the timeline of how many signatures, how many it takes for it gets to Yeah, so, so Rich's, uh, Rich's is on the, the timeline here for signatures. So, uh, the, the law, I know it was actually one of the toughest initiative processes in the country. So we need about officially 65,000 signatures. Um, that's 6% of registered voters. You have to get 6% of 18 out of the 35 districts. So you got to make sure you right, distribute those, those signatures. And um, uh, that means we need about 100,000. We've got to do that by the end of April. Um, although we're doing well on the signatures. We're, we're ahead of the plan so far, but it's a it's a big number and it's a heavy load. What do you question for that? We have more, we have things you can sign today. <laughs> yes, we have we have signatures. Yes, sir. So um, if if I only want to vote for two, can I only mark two? Would be my first question. And can I mark the same person four times? Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to rank all four candidates. You can just rank one if you want to, or just two. 
And um, but you can't break the same candidate four times. Is that a little back here? Well, how do we sign? We have signature right books here. floating around right here, so come on down. Todd, are you able to stay around after the meeting for people that have more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, we can stay around. Yes. When you state your affiliation in IFO right now under the system, is there any consequence if you're a registered Republican voter but may identify otherwise? I mean, there's no follow-up, so anyone can register as a Republican voter if they wanted to. Um, it's for primary, if you're already registered with another party, let's say you're part of the Libertarian and you want to register as a Republican, you got to do that about 10 weeks before the primary because there's a, there's a cutoff there. Uh, for independence, you can declare a party affiliation the same day in, in the primary when you show up. Um, and so that's, that's certainly an option for independence. Uh, kind of defeats the point of being an independent. Um, a lot of people don't want to declare the party affiliation. Uh, but um, but that is that is another option to, to vote. Just in. as the interim until your guys' great initiative. Well, passed. that that's true. You don't have to, or you do. You can declare as a Republican. But what we know from the numbers is that Idaho is junk. They don't want to declare for a party. Two hundred seventy thousand of them are independent. So, like, they technically could, and yet they choose not to, and then they can't vote. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Oh, I, I did it, and I told the precinct when I did it that I am an independent voter, you know, a more liberal person. And you should have seen the score I got, but I voted proudly. <laughs> <laughs> I guess our worst nightmare. Liberal person voting in primary. Good. Any, uh, any other questions? All right. Well, we appreciate the time very much. Thank you. And, uh, uh, I'll be around if you've got any other questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Todd and Rebecca, for, for presenting that. Uh, it does sound like they have sign-up sheets, and we'll stick around if you're interested in signing. And that, uh, that concludes our meeting. We will be donating $10 to the Magic Valley Children's Museum on your behalf. Thank you to all the guests who came today. Would you all stand and join me in the four-way test, please?